Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, in the name of God, compassionate and merciful. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a very interesting topic. I'll get right to it because we're short on time. Uh, the primary text of Islam is called the Quran, as you may or may not know. Muslims believe that it was revealed uh, to the final Abrahamic prophet, that's a prophet with an uppercase P, his name was Muhammad, peace be upon him, who lived in the 6th and 7th centuries. Um, the Quran explicitly mentions uh, Al-Yahud wa Nasara, the Jews and the Christians, and gives them the epithet uh, the honorable epithet of Ahlul Kitab in Arabic, which is translated as the people of the book. Uh, so initially, theologians would, uh, they would interpret the book, Al Kitab, as being the Bible, the people of the Bible, because the word Bible, Biblion in Greek, means book, and the Bible in Arabic is called Al Kitab, Al Kitab al Muqaddas, or the holy book. Uh, now, during the 2nd and 3rd centuries of uh, the Muslim calendar, during the Islamic uh, expansion, uh, Muslims came to realize that there are a lot more religions in the world than just Judaism and Christianity. So, theologians at the time, they actually expanded the meaning of the title Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book, uh, to any religion that, uh, that reveres some sort of sacred text. So Hindus, Buddhists, uh, Zoroastrians, etc. So under the Muslim polity in pre-modern times, the religious traditions, these religious traditions, were given uh, protected status, freedom of worship, and autonomous rule uh, of their own religious courts. So was there absolutely equal rights amongst all the religions? No, that was not seen anywhere in the world at the time. Uh, but what was happening in the Muslim lands was really unparalleled at that time throughout the rest of the world. And this is why we find uh, historical Christian communities in Muslim-majority countries, even today. Uh, so uh, were there atrocities committed? Were there people that um, were um, oppressive? Yes. But this idea of you know, hordes of Muslim armies coming in and forcing people to convert uh, is pretty much a myth. Even the man who wrote the book, Answering Islam, uh, there's Norman Geisler. Uh, he actually says in that book, the reason why the North African Christians actually became Muslim so quickly was because of low taxes and stress on brotherhood. That's the power of taxes. <laughs> no. Um, but there's a verse in the Quran, the second chapter, verse 256, that says, La ikraha fi There's no compulsion in religion. Right? And this is important, it's interesting because uh, Pope Benedict XVI, he gave uh, a, a, a talk at Regensburg University in Germany, September 12th, interesting date, 2006, uh, where he quoted this verse, there's no compulsion in religion, and he said, this verse is abrogated Right? This verse has been canceled by other verses in the Quran, which call for fighting the infidel. Right? Um, so abrogation in and of itself is a contentious issue within Quranic sciences. Uh, probably the most authoritative um, scholar on this issue is an Egyptian scholar named Imam Suyuti. You don't have to remember that, but this is a text that most of the students will, will know and study called Al-Itqan fi al-Qulun quran Anyway, he says in there that there are about 19 or 20 or 21 abrogated verses in the Quran, and this verse is not one of them. I haven't come across a single scholar in my life that has said that this verse, there's no compulsion in religion, has been abrogated. Um, because it doesn't make sense to abrogate it. You can't force someone to believe in something, right? I can't force you to believe that the moon is uh, made of cheese, right? Uh, you can say, oh yeah, I believe, I believe, but I can't force that in your heart, so it doesn't make sense that this verse would be abrogated. There's no precedent for that, so I don't know what he's quoting here. Uh, we'll give you examples of historical Christian communities in Muslim majority countries. The Coptic Christians in Egypt, they've been there for 2,000 years. Their claim is that St. Mark founded their church. The church of the Assyrians in Iraq, uh, which is also called, I think they call it the ancient Assyrian Church of the East, or Ancient Apostolic Church of the East, 
Their claim is that St. Thaddeus founded their church. I've lived in Yemen. I've, I've been to monasteries in Yemen. I've met nuns that lived in Yemen. Uh, I've been to North Africa. I've met Christians there. In fact, according to Pew, 50, there are 50 Muslim-majority countries, and there are churches in all of them except for two, and that's Saudi Arabia uh, and Mauritania. And Saudi Arabia is sort of weird theologically, <laughs> but it's interesting, Saudi Arabia, there are two million Christians living in Saudi Arabia. There's no churches in Saudi Arabia. There are two million Christians living in Saudi Arabia, mostly foreign workers, which is interesting because per capita, there are more Christians living in Saudi Arabia than there are Muslims living in America, <laughs> which is interesting. Uh, and then, uh, so there's about 50 million Christians living in the Muslim majority world in the Middle East, 50 million, compared to about 44 million Muslims living in Egypt. So there are more Christians in the Middle East than there are Muslims in Europe. Now, if you look at Muslim Spain or North Africa, this is sometimes called the golden age of Judaism. Right? This is when Jewish systematic theology and philosophy crystallized. You have these major uh, classical Jewish works being produced in Arabic rather than in Hebrew, later, later translated into Hebrew. I'll just give you a few of them. Kitab al-Amanat wa al-I'tiqadat. It's called Emunot uh, Vadorot. This is by Sa'ya Gayo al-Fayumi, a great scholar uh, in Judaism, Beliefs and Opinions. He wrote this book in Arabic. It's, a, it's an incredible book. I've thumbed through it a little bit. Very difficult. There's another book, Al-Hidayah ila Fara'id al-Qulub, which is called Chovot Halavavot by Rabbi Ibn Fakuda, Duties of the Heart. He wrote this in Arabic. You have Kitab al-Hujjah wa dalil or called the Khuzari, Rabbi Yehuda Halavi. Then you have the two great works by Maimonides, who's called Musa ibn Maimun uh, al-Qurtubi in Arabic. His first book is called Kitab al-Fara'id, which is in Hebrew, Sefer Ha-Mitzvot, the Book of the Commandments. He wrote this in Arabic. And then you have the magnum opus, very, very difficult, but incredible, Dilal al hayrim the guide for the perplexed, Mori Nebuchim, by also by the Rambam, Maimonides. So the worldview of the Quran is one in which other religions are acknowledged and accepted, and that these other religions will always be there. So the goal is not global Islamic domination, right? The goal is peaceful coexistence. And the technical legal term for this is musalaha, musalaha. And if you want to do research on the charter, sometimes called the Constitution of Medina, when the Prophet went into Medina, he had a charter or constitution drafted. Um, so uh, you can do a Google search on that if you want. However, the Quran does not advocate a type of perennial philosophy where all religions are seen as equally true. According to the Quran, there are correct beliefs and there are incorrect beliefs. There is a way of theologizing or speaking about God that is correct and a way of theologizing that is incorrect. Uh, either God incarnates or he doesn't. Uh, either Jesus is God or he's not. He's either the Messiah or he isn't. And the Quran goes into these issues. The Quran encourages interfaith dialogue. The Prophet himself engaged with dialogue with some Nestorian Christians who came to Medina and he housed them in his mosque for three days and they engaged in interfaith dialogue. So me coming here today is considered what I would say a sunnah, the normative practice of the Prophet himself. There was a Catholic uh, lady who came to the mosque in San Ramon. She was quite elderly. She said, I remember a time when I was not allowed to go into a mosque, pre-Vatican II. Very interesting. Now in with this, when the Prophet was living in Medina, he was the head of state in Medina, the Muslims were living under constant siege in the city. God gave the Prophet and the Muslims permission to physically defend themselves. So the stance in Mecca for 13 years was one of assertive non-violence. And in Medina, you have active resistance with specific rules of engagement. So the first verse revealed to the Prophet in the Quran, chapter 22, verse 39, that gave him uh, permission to physically defend his city. It sounds like this in Arabic. It says, all of these verbs are in the passive. It says, permission is given to those who are being fought against to fight 
because they have been wronged, and indeed God is able to give them victory. So active resistance or martial action can only be called for by legitimate state authority, not by vigilantes, and is used to defend one's community. The very next verse says, Who are these people, the Muslims that are given permission to defend themselves? They are those who are expelled from their homes unjustifiably. Except that they said, our Lord is Allah, our Lord is the God of Abraham. And that also entails a belief in the Quran and in the Prophet Muhammad. And then the Quran says, If God did not check one people against another, in other words, if God did not reveal a just war theory, if God did not reveal rules of engagement when it comes to active uh, resistance, the Quran says, then you would have seen many temples, synagogues, and churches, and mosques destroyed where the name of God is celebrated. So the initial impetus for active resistance is to ensure religious pluralism according to the Quran to ensure sacred spaces of worship and devotion for people of various religious traditions. And I preempted questions. This is why ISIS is not Islamic. It is a plague upon humanity that the Prophet actually warned us against. There was a group of early Muslims who broke off from the guidance of the Prophet. They were called the Karajites, right, or the Khawarij in Arabic. And today we have neo karajites you know, people who are violent, exclusivist, people who are terrorists. And the Prophet said they come in waves over time, and it's our duty to oppose them. So I want you to remember this analogy. It's a very effective analogy. ISIS is to Islam as the Ku Klux Klan is to Christianity. So a question I get all the time is, why don't Muslims like you, your leaders, your scholars, why don't you go out and condemn ISIS, right? And if you go to a mosque and you start talking about ISIS, Muslims start rolling their eyes. They say, oh, this again? Why don't you talk about something else, right? So I, people who ask me this question, I always say to them, have you ever Googled Muslim leaders condemn ISIS? And nobody has ever Googled it. So I'll just mention a few things here. Uh, the Islamic Society of North America, or called, it's called ISNA, they actually released something called the Code of Honor, where they condemn ISIS. This is a huge organization in North America. There's something called the Covenants Initiative. Dr. John Andrew Morrow is uh, spearheading that. And this is something that is uh, known in North America as well, where he condemns ISIS and he has signatories to that. There's something called the Open Letter to Baghdadi, the so-called Caliph of ISIS. Uh, there's 120 signatories by scholars all around the Muslim world. And these are people who have sway over the hearts and minds of tens of millions of people condemning ISIS. Uh, the Council uh, on American Islamic Relations, which is called CARE, is constantly condemning and repudiating ISIS. There's something called the Muslim Council of Great Britain in 2014 that released a statement condemning ISIS. There's an incredible book written by an incredible scholar of Damascus. His name is Sheikh Muhammad al Yaqubi. Uh, he's a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. It's called Refuting ISIS. He wrote it in Arabic and then he himself translated it into English. It's very short. You can probably find it online quite easily. Refuting ISIS, an ideological refutation of ISIS. You have the Muslim Public Affairs Council in 2014 that released a statement condemning ISIS. You have the Amman message where 200 scholars signed a declaration, Amman Jordan, uh, denouncing ISIS. You have a fatwa that was issued by Al-Azhar University, the oldest university on the planet in 2014, that denounced ISIS. The Arab League in 2014 made a statement denouncing ISIS. In December of 2015, 100,000 Indian scholars and teachers signed a declaration, 100,000 uh, denouncing ISIS. And then you have the Marrakesh in Morocco declaration denouncing ISIS uh, as well. So these things are out there. 
but it's strange how they don't make it into a MSM or mainstream media, as it were. Uh, I'm, I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop at this point. Um, hopefully I answered the question. I'm looking forward to your, to your questions and conversations later. Thank you for your attention. Now uh, open up the uh, floor to questions, and we do have a microphone that is going to go around and uh, wherever it is. That's the one. So you can use this mic here. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So just raise your hand, and you'll get a microphone. There's a person right there. And try to keep your questions short and on the topic, since we only have an hour for this event. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, you need a microphone. Oh, she has a mic. I'm sorry. This is Tom. Forget about your question. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll talk really fast. I'll talk my boss and talk. Thank you very much. It was a very informative talk, and I appreciate it. Um, as a former Catholic, I was condemned to hell if I were to go into a Protestant church, let alone a Muslim place of worship. Uh, one of the most uh, glorious experiences in my life was in southern India when the Muslims, the Christians, and the Hindi all had places of worship and all could walk together on the street. It was absolutely phenomenal. And so my question to you would be, would you ever see that that might happen here in the United States where we're all accepted of, um, you know, accepting of others' religions and we all can openly worship? I, I think we I think we have that here. I think um, uh, I think of, with respect to that, America is at the the top of the list as far as uh, acceptance and toleration of religions. Um, I'll tell you this: um, I've outside of elementary school, I've never experienced any type of. And I used to debate Christians, by the way. I used to be Muslim polemicist when I was an undergrad in high school. You know, you're young, you're not married, you got all this energy. So we go on debate, and I'm, I've had nothing but positive responses, and you know, no one's ever pulled me and insulted me. You know, kids do these type of things. They're kids, right? They don't know. But, um, so, and it's interesting, I have a, a friend who lives in Iraq. Uh, he's actually my wife's teacher's husband. My wife's Arabic teacher's husband. Uh, and I actually, when I was in Yemen, I, he was one of my teachers there as well. Sometimes we talk, and he says, "Oh, there's American soldiers here around the corner, and you know, I'm just afraid they're gonna they're gonna kill all of us." And then he says to me, "How how are you living in America? You are you constantly threatened every day by people?" And I said, "I've never in my life been threatened one time." So as far as that goes, I think America is actually a, a model that the rest of the world can actually learn from. Obviously, it's not a perfect society, but what society is perfect, right? Yes. Uh, who has the phone? Uh, yeah. And then there's a gentleman here. Yeah. I skipped him again. Sorry. <laughs> you raised a very important point about the various uh, Muslim organizations that have come out against ISIS. And my question is, why haven't major? I mean, this is big. Why yeah. aren't they telling people that Muslims have objected? I mean, that would cover so many, take care of so many concerns. I don't know, you have to ask them. You, we have to ask questions like who actually runs the media. That's, that's, those are real questions that, that I think we're being diverted from. So that's what I would do if I were even researching. Who actually, uh, are, are these people actually doing things for our best interest? What's actually happening? Who are these people? We can find out who these people are. Yes, have we seen any differences or variations of toleration uh, of other faith traditions between Sunni and Shia Muslims? That's a good question. Um, certainly with the invasion of Iraq, this it's kind of created a, a power vacuum in Iraq. Now, Sunnis and Shias have been around for 1,200 years. And in Iraq, they've lived in relative peace. Uh, the major difference between, and somewhat might even call it a negligible difference. There's really no difference theologically that's major. Uh, but the difference is in political theory. Uh, who who uh, 
who should rule the Muslim Ummah or nation, as it were? And the Shias say it must be a descendant of the Prophet. Uh, so I think a lot of these things, I think there's always been little pockets of disputed violence since, you know, since you know, the Middle Ages and even before that. But I think with what's going on in the news and the world, those little things are sort of aggrandized and put forward as, and presented as sort of this global conflict, you know. Um, so, you know, there's the, I, I call it the, the, the Santa Claus effect. You know, you have the, um, you have the true Santa Claus, who was, I don't know, a fourth century Christian priest who used to give candy to children that he died and he's gone. And you have this sort of mythological Santa Claus that flies around at night, goes down your chimney, that doesn't really exist. So a lot of this, this idea of you know your next door neighbor could be Al Qaeda, you know. So even if you know even if he's a nice guy, and, you know that's called taqiyya. They they learn these words that 99.9 percent of Muslims have never even heard of, right? But you know people like Daniel Pipes, for example, he puts it out there and says you know if a Muslim is 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 nice to you and tells you he doesn't want to kill you, he's lying because he's sanctioned by God to lie to you. That's prudential concealment. If you can do that, then don't kill you later. Like, what? <laughs> I mean, I did a PhD in Islam. I didn't learn about this. <laughs> or he's kidding. I mean, yeah, there's something in the deep, dark sort of recesses of Sharia that, you know, if a guy has a gun to your head and says, are you Muslim? You can say, no. Nope. Sure ain't. To save your life. Right? Uh, but this thing is sort of just a grand dot. So this is what all Muslims are doing. They believe in us. That's what they're doing in America. So, Rudy, Sunni Shia you differences. Sorry, do you want a question? Oh, Rudy? Yes, there's a gentleman back here who's had his hand up. Okay, oh, um, go so ahead. Can you do that? Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, I noticed you used the term Mus Muslim majority nation as kind of a political, politically correct uh, term to use, but uh, I don't think we help our situation if we maybe try to, if we obscure what really is going on so because in reality the history of islam has been more than just muslim majority it's been muslim rule with daras al-islam and wherever islam has spread to its you know once it got past a certain extent uh, it has sought to establish its own rule whether it be you know, kind of a separatist movement or even taking over governments of the countries where it has spread so i, I wanted to now, granted, Christianity had a lot of had a really bad history of not separating church and state. Uh, we have largely learned the lesson of that. I, I want to just uh, I really want to challenge this. I think we have to be honest that there's still a problem with Islam of uh, the lack of separation of mosque and state. And really throughout the Middle East, uh, what you have is they're not majority, Muslim majority nations, you have nations under Islamic rule. Sir, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just gonna ask, you know. To, to react to that and say, I think there are a lot of people who probably, you know, maybe feel, you know, think this way, but are uh, afraid to bring it up. Yeah, so I, I would agree with you, the, the pre-modern world, uh, you have empires vying for land. Uh, I also think that a lot of what's happening in Muslim, Muslim majority countries, again, to use that, what do you call a PC term, is a direct result of uh, colonialism in that area that Muslims haven't necessarily recovered from. Uh, and then as far as uh, under Islamic rule, um, you know, there's, uh, in the Quran does not mandate any form of government. If you can show me a verse in the Quran that says, thou shalt have a theocracy, I'll be glad to agree with you that, you know, there should be no separation of mosque and state. But you have Saudi Arabia, which is a kingdom you know, and the early Muslims, when, when the caliphate became a kingdom, a lot of early Muslims, they, they frowned upon that. You have, uh, you have democratic movements uh, in the Muslim majority countries, like Syria in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, Iran, the president or the prime minister of Iran, who said that, uh, actually was a great admirer of Thomas Jefferson, but we can't have him, right? So he was removed from power by the CIA and the Shah was put in, and the Shah was quite cruel, and he would torture Muslims. My own family members, some of them, were, were tortured by him. Uh, uh, and so you have these sort of, I mean, Saddam Hussein is another example. This is someone who's shaking hands with our defense uh, 
uh, Secretary of Defense in the 1980s, uh, the CIA trained Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, uh, and so did MI5. Uh, so you have American or Western interests in that region um, that are turning that region into absolute chaos uh, for different reasons. Uh, but you know, you have different forms of government all over the Middle East. So let's take one more question. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that Saudi Arabia is kind of an anomaly in yeah. terms of, uh, can you uh, kind of elucidate a little more about yeah. how to frame that? Yeah, it's very interesting. Point. Because, again, we talk about sacred law, Sharia, right? People hear the word Sharia and they start wanting to hide. Sharia literally means a path to cold water, right? So Sharia is an indispensable part of Muslim's identity. It's like saying you can be a Jew, but you can't follow the halakha law. Or you can be a Christian, but you can't follow the Bible. It's like, what are you talking about? You know, when most Muslims hear the word Sharia, they think prayer and fasting, and like, uh, can I eat this because there's gelatin in it? That's what 99% of Muslims are thinking about. So Sharia is very fast. There isn't one way of doing Sharia, right? So for example, in Afghanistan, uh, again, a, a country that's been under attack for 40 years, uh, you have places in Afghanistan where women do not leave their homes, and they're not allowed to leave their homes. Uh, and if you say, what are you, what are you people doing? That's so oppressive. Uh, the elders of a certain city will say, this is the Sharia. They can't, that's their interpretation of it. If you go over to the border, over the border to Iran, half the physicians, and again, Iran's not perfect, no country's perfect, obviously not perfect, but half the physicians in Iran are women. 70% of college students are women. And if you say, well, why, do you, why is it like this? They say, this is Sharia. <laughs> the Prophet said, the, the acquisition of knowledge is an obligation upon every type of Muslim. Right? Uh, so it's very vast. Now you have Saudi Arabia, they have their own laws. They say women can't drive cars. Okay? What? That's their interpretation of the Sharia. Right? And as far as theologically, their, their uh, theological stances are very different than traditional Sunni or even Shi'i stances. So they're very uh, uh, tekfiri, they anathematize Muslims that don't believe exactly as they believe. And Saudi Arabia is one of our biggest allies, by the way, um, which is interesting. Uh, but anyway, not, making, not getting too much into politics. Um, <laughs> but uh, so theologically, there's sort of an outlier. You know, this idea that if you don't believe exactly as we believe, that we don't consider you Muslim. Uh, traditional Islam, traditional Sunni Islam, always recognizes difference of opinion, uh, and that um, difference of opinion, there's actually a, a hadith, a statement of the Prophet, which is not exactly authentic, but is quoted a lot by scholars as sort of, set, as sort of being true in principle, that difference of opinion among scholars is a mercy from God. It's not sort of a, a fitna or a cause of strife amongst people. Um, so there is no true there is no true separation of church and state. I mean, you have Rick Santorum wanting to, you know, put abortion into law, and he's doing that because he's a Catholic. Now, I'm not saying he shouldn't do that. What I'm saying is there's a difference between a secular society and secularism. The, the secularism means let's banish religion to the household. Right, not even talk about it at all, right? But a secular society allows for religious discourse. You know, I mean, he can go up there and say abortion is wrong because the Bible says so. He probably won't get that law passed, but he can try, right? Uh, and he might convince a few people. So religion is on the forefront. I mean, everyone in, the, in, the, in Congress, almost everyone, believes in God. So there really is no true separation. Of Religion and, and, and the state are never truly divorced anywhere you go around the world. <clears throat> so I think we also have a problem with that. If that's what you want to do, create a totally secular society where there's no religion, then you're in the wrong country. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Our second speaker today is Rabbi Larry Milder. Um, from Congregation Beth Hammock in Pleasanton. Okay.
Okay, that, that's all. Yeah. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ati, uh, for a brilliant and really uh, uh, educational talk that I, I learned so much from. What a pleasure. And thank you, Ruth, for the invitation to speak to Religion Chat. Um, that's probably my wife. No. <laughs> um, I consider it a great honor to be here, and uh, it's really a pleasure. This is actually the second time that uh, Dr. Ortiz and I have shared the, the panel presented to Religion Chat. Um, the topic of what does your faith teach about the acceptance of other religions is particularly <laughs> provocative. No religion thinks that all other religions are equally true. Although I know that some of you would probably debate even that. <laughs> but I would maintain that every religion believes that there is something true about its own faith which makes it distinctive and unlike other religions. If they don't think that they are necessarily better, they do nonetheless disagree with some teachings of any other religion. Nor is this something to be embarrassed about. Religions are ways of looking at the world, ways of making meaning out of the raw stuff of human experience. And humans being social creatures, we are inclined to make meaning in communities. We treasure our particular traditions because in many ways, they give cosmic expression to our sense of belonging. They ground us. So, for example, we, for we Jews, the autumn is the time of transition, the turning of the year. We mark time Jewishly. And by doing so, not only do we make sense of our personal experience of the passing of time, we simultaneously root our lives in the experience of our people. <clears throat> when a person dies, we mourn Jewishly. Our rituals give context to the unstable moments in our lives when life is at risk of losing its meaning. Is that me? <laughs> when, uh, when we consider our ethical obligations, we do so Jewishly. We don't give charity, we do tzedakah, justice. The action means something unique to Judaism, unlike the meaning of charity, which comes from karatas, caring. <laughs> We don't do it because we are moved by feelings of caring, but because we see justice as an obligation, even when we don't feel like doing it. Yes, Judaism is different, as are other religions from one another. That doesn't make it better. Our problem with understanding the difference between being different and being better it's an epistemological problem. That is, a problem with the way we think about things. Our culture is biased toward universalism. We think that which is universal is, by definition, better than that which is particular. It's all very Kantian. Judaism is an answer to that bias. And it, it's not the ice cream truck, is it? <laughs> Judaism is really countercultural. We affirm the absolute value of particularism. My being Jewish is not secondary to my being human. It is the way I am human. My particularism and my universalism are not in competition with one another. 
I am Jewish with my whole being, and anything less than that would be an admission that I consider Judaism not to have ultimate significance in my life. Our culture really does try to repress those particularisms that make life beautiful and make humanity so interesting. You know, you don't get harmony unless we are singing different notes. We all love ethnic food, right? Ethnic food is whatever we don't cook at home. <laughs> So just how do Jews navigate that path where we say, yay, Jews, and at the same time say with Mr. Rogers, won't you be my neighbor? <laughs> we do not agree with Christians over the divinity of Jesus. If we did, we'd be Christian. We do not agree. Would it be better if I used sure. that hand held by Paul? Let's turn this one off. Take care. <clears throat> Try this one. I actually have the same problem I said to it, so if you figure it out, <laughs> Rand, it is it is it is random. Um, we don't agree with Muslims that Muhammad received a unique revelation from God, because if we did, we'd be Muslim. Not that there are other, aren't other points of difference. Let's face it, Christians don't agree with one another about Christian teachings, as we just heard. Muslims don't agree with one another about Muslim teachings. By the way, we Jews have the same problem. I could go on about each religion and our point of departure, not to mention the overwhelming commonalities of our faiths. The key is, do we acknowledge the ultimate value of the other's particularity? I may not agree with their beliefs, but can I see the other as children of God who, just like me, live lives that are shaped by their unique, particular relationship with God? What cannot be logically true, you think Jesus is God and I don't, may nonetheless be spiritually true. And here I believe I can assert that Judaism stands precisely for that kind of embrace of the other. It is the virtue of spiritual ambiguity, a value that very concrete religionists usually do not appreciate. To be honest, there are Jews who don't get that either, but they are certainly a minority in the Jewish world. Let me give you three examples from our tradition. First, Amos. Amos the prophet is criticizing the people. That's, after all, the job of a prophet. He's criticizing them for their arrogance. He says to them, to me, O Israelites, you are just like the Ethiopians. True, he says on behalf of God, I brought Israel up from the land of Egypt, but also the Philistines from Kaftor and the Arameans from Kir. In other words, so there, don't think you're so special. I, God, have a relationship with all these peoples. Your relationship is special to you, theirs is special to them. So, you're not better, and by the way, don't go picking on them either. <laughs> This is about as far from ethnocentrism and chauvinism as you can get, and it is right there in the earliest prophet in the Bible. Let's leap forward about 900 years, and the rabbis are debating who qualifies for eternal life, you know, who gets a place in what they call the world to come. In other words, do you have to be one of us to get in? And there we find the statement, quote, the righteous of all peoples have a share in the world to come. And that has been the majority view among Jews for the past 2,000 years. Of course there is a minority. You can find the minority viewpoint at Chabad.org. Finally, let's consider the Middle Ages when Jews were faced with the competing claims of Christianity and Islam. 
Now, the Torah is explicit in its condemnation of idolatry and the worship of other gods. The question then arose in the Middle Ages about whether Judaism defined these other religions as worshiping other gods. At first, the question was difficult. Maimonides, whom you just heard about, actually had no trouble seeing that Islam does not practice idolatry, but he wasn't so sure about Christianity. But this question is no longer in doubt, and it really couldn't be once emancipation came to the Jews and the ghetto walls came down. You know, when we attend one another's worship services, our experience, not our doctrine, tells us whom we are worshiping. A beautiful statement of contemporary Jewish belief can be found in a document entitled Dabru Emet Speak Truth, which is a kind of Jewish counterpart to Nostra Aetate. And the leading sentence of the document is, quote, Jews and Christians worship the same God. Now this hardly exhausts the questions that might legitimately be raised, but it is my attempt to place Jewish attitudes in a broader context of the way we think about being religious. Have Jewish attitudes toward other religions changed over time? Certainly. But Judaism itself and other religions as well have changed. We do not cease being authentically Jewish when we acknowledge the glory and wisdom of humanity's many encounters with the divine. Our particularity is our humanity, and that is why each of our paths can be ultimately true. So let me stop there. I know that we want to make sure we get to do some questions. Yes, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. I have a question for you. Uh, I'm a Muslim. Do you believe in uh, Jesus Christ? Do you believe in Moses? Do you all the messenger of God? In our book, 86 times the uh, name of Moses mentioned, 29 times Jesus Christ, and it's a 12 chapter of Mary. Jesus mother. So I want to see you as a Jew. What do you think about Jesus Christ? Uh, in Tanakh, what is most common about Jesus Christ? And are you believing even Jesus was a messenger of God? Thank you. Uh, I think it's a fair question that, that any reasonable person would want to, to know. What do you say about the major religious figure of another faith. Um, part of it goes back to what do we mean when we say, we believe in. When Muslims say they have a belief in Jesus, it's not, it does, the word does not mean the same thing. Belief does not mean the same thing as what Christians mean when they say we believe in Jesus. Um, of course, Jesus is important to Islam. Jesus is not important to Judaism. Um, that's a hard thing for people to hear. But it is, Jesus is no more significant to the practice of Judaism than Buddha. That does not mean that there is a negative association, nor being historically honest, would I have any reason not to believe that Jesus lived, but as far as I know, he lived and died as a Jew. Um, and that's actually all I could say is as far as I know. Um, what I can do is respect the teachings that great minds of other faiths have offered us. Many times we see ourselves in those teachings. So when I read the um, when I read the texts in the Gospels that cite Jesus' homilies, I'm struck by how much they reflect Pharisaic Judaism. 
They really are the same teachings as the Pharisees. That doesn't mean there aren't disagreements. Of course there's disagreements. But the style of teaching is the same style. The, the actual language is sometimes identical language to what you could find in rabbinic teachings. Um, so we sense, oh, we're on the same page. Um, that uh, does not involve my acknowledgement of Jesus' divinity in any way. Um, and so when I hear some of the teachings of Muhammad, I, I listen, I go, oh, I get it, I get it. This is like, yeah, uh, this, you know, this, this, this whole tradition of uh, what we call tzedakah, the, the, the comparable obligation of Muslims, to, to give charity, why? We're, we're talking the same thing, or for that matter, we actually have the same debate about gelatin, you know? Like, it, it, we're talking the same language. Language, yeah, we're, we're, we share concepts. And obviously, there's more in common between all these three particular religions than disagree. As far as the individuals, actually, they do not function in any religious way in Judaism, which is understandable. Judaism's earlier. It, it comes first. It's understandable. These are, uh, are not people who play a role within our own tradition, uh, and even though they're the seminal figures of other faiths. I hope I've done a, a fair job in, in answering your question. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Over there. Oh, there's, there's one here and then I'll Okay, fine. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I'm a Catholic Christian, and uh, when, as you know, what we believe about Jesus is that he is the Messiah, and my understanding of Judaism is that, of course, they don't believe that he is the Messiah. What is the current Jewish thinking? What Messiah are you still seeking, or a savior, or in, conceptually, is it spiritual, or is it earthly, or what is it? It, it's an interesting question too. The, let me go back to the Bible, okay? The notion of uh, Mashiach, Messiah, is uh, an idea that emerges primarily in the period <coughs> of the Babylonian exile. Um, the term in Hebrew, Mashiach, means anointed one, and it refers to somebody chosen by God for a particular purpose. In the Bible, it simply means, generally it means a king. Sometimes it, it means somebody else who's designated uh, for a special purpose, like the high priest. In the Bible, it has absolutely no um, supernatural connotation and no uh, there is uh, no notion of this being something that appears at the end of time or anything of the sort until you get to the book of Daniel, which is the last book of the Hebrew Bible to be written, and it's written during the Greek period. But anything before Daniel, Mashiach simply means leader, the one God picked. In fact, it doesn't even have to be a Jew. Cyrus is called Mashiach. Why? God picked him to free the Jews, as if that was his primary concern. Obviously, the Jews were a blip on the radar as far as he was concerned. But for the Jews, he was everything. Oh my gosh, the Messiah has come. Why? They don't mean anything supernatural. Just thank God you picked him, because now we're free. But in the, in the um, exilic period, the prophets developed a notion that didn't previously exist. They'd lost their country. They'd lost the kingdom. The Davidic monarchy was over, and they said, someday God will bring us home. Someday God will, will let us go home, and we'll have our country back. And what's the symbol of a country? Your own king, instead of being ruled by a foreign king. Then a messiah, a ruler who is authorized, really a righteous ruler, a descendant of David, will, will be our ruler again. Did they imagine that this would happen um, centuries later? No, they imagined it would happen in the immediate future. And it did, more or less. Well, they got to go home, because the Babylonian exile only lasted approximately 50 years. They get to go home again. They don't get their monarchy back. So there is no Mashiach. Nobody gets it. You know, the, the descendants of David do not get reappointed to the throne, and that's the end of the monarchy. As far as we're concerned, no Messiah. 
And they didn't like start saying, oh, it'll happen, you know, centuries from now. That was never a Jewish concept, nor did they have a notion of the Messiah being a supernatural figure. And least of all, a relative of God's. Any more than the rest of us, which we all are. Um, well, uh, this is the major departure of Christianity, of course. And uh, it, it, there we, we part company over that idea. Um, and uh, so I, that's basically, I, I think, you know, what do we think now? Uh, for, for a very long time, Jews have basically been non, uh, unattached to the notion of a personal Messiah. It exists in symbolic language in our prayers. Symbolically, it's there, except for the Reform Movement, which is the largest movement of Judaism in the United States, where we don't even have that language. We take it, even that personal Messiah language out of our prayer book. But what we do retain is the core biblical concept of someday things will be healed, someday things will be right. They're broken now, but we believe in a coming time when things will be put back together. That's what our ancestors during the Babylonian exile believed, and that's what we believe today. Someday, and it can happen soon, the world can be fixed. So a good term for that is the Messianic Age. Certainly, we don't want to be ruled by a king. We're beyond that. And we don't want to go back to that any more than we want to go back to sacrifices. Judaism is an evolving faith. It's not frozen in time. And where we are right now is it's still messianic. We are a messianic faith, but not in the form of a personal messiah. Mm -hmm. 